To the left hand side for Vieira, who will play it through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus to finish it off. Oh, and what a way to do it! Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal. He's back and he's back with a bang. Into the penalty area it goes. Gabriel header and it's into the back of the net. Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the daily Arsenal podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the Scouting Report here on the Chronicles of Aguna, the daily Arsenal podcast with me, your host, Harry Simiu. Really, really excited about this one. Really, really looking forward to talking Ricardo Calafiori, uh, the Azzurri and Bologna defender that at the time of recording is being heavily heavily linked with a move to Arsenal. Now, by the time you listen to this, he might be an Arsenal player. He might not be an Arsenal player. Um, But I'm recording this at the point where we're hearing of serious interest from the Gunners and um, we're hearing that progress is being made, at least from the Italian side of things. We've not really heard a great deal from the English side of things other than there is some interest in this player. We're hoping it develops. We're hoping that things move forward. But I figured given how loud the noise is around the potential move for Calafiori to Arsenal, it would be the right time to bring you guys another edition of the Scouting Report. 22-year-old defender, 1.88 metres in height. And if you told me to draw you a sketch of what a great Italian centre-back would look like, I think I'd draw out something pretty much bang on in terms of what Ricardo Calafiori looks like. He really does literally look the part. Reminds me of uh, Alessandro Nesta in his heyday, the long hair, the hairband. He looks athletic, he looks tall, he looks strong, he looks brilliant. And um, the optics are great, put it that way. He's a good looking lad. He's going to raise the um, uh, the overall uh, standards of um handsomeness in the Arsenal squad I think you can say uh, if indeed he does arrive bit of background on the player uh, as I mentioned 22 years old born in Roma the eternal city for whom he formerly played he came up through the ranks at Roma uh, did go out on loan to Genoa in January 2022 but then returned to Roma before uh, in August 2022 being sold abroad to Switzerland to FC Basel in a deal worth just 2.6 million euros. Now, he did return to Italian football around about a year later for 4 million euros. However, FC Basel were really, really clever here because what they did was they put a sell-on clause in this deal which means from what I understand that they could receive potentially up to 40% of whatever Bologna sell Riccardo Calafiori on for and that's why we're hearing Bologna are uh, adamant that nothing less than 50 million euros is going to do the trick here now Bologna obviously qualified for the Champions League last season they had a remarkable campaign under Thiago Motta and Riccardo Calafiori played a huge part in that. So there will be a reluctance on their part to let him go. But if the price is right, um, I've said it so many times that the Premier League clubs, yes, they're handicapped a little bit at the moment by uh, PSR, held back by PSR, if you like. But there is still a world where, um, you know, the Premier League clubs and their financial might can at times force the likes of Bologna into a sale, even if deep down it's not really something they want to do now we know that Juve are interested in him we know that Inter have been interested in him in the past Milan have been linked as well but we also know that Bologna a have a preference to sell abroad and that b none of those clubs right now can get anywhere near Arsenal in terms of financial power and might and therefore it is far more likely that we find an agreement with Bologna um, that suits them in terms of the sale price than any of those other clubs do normally with Italian players I'm a bit worried about whether they actually want to move abroad because there's a tendency 
when it comes to Italian stars to want to stay at home, to want to stay in their own league. The footballing culture is so rich and strong there. They would have grown up supporting big clubs in the country. Um, and often it's difficult to prize those types of players away. And they do sometimes use the interest um, or, or use fake interest in some cases uh, of sort of Premier League clubs, La Liga clubs to kind of drive up a price. But ultimately, eventually they end up doing business with one of their domestic rivals and with the players' willingness to stay in Italy, sometimes, you know, that's that's just how it goes. We've seen it happen to us before where we've been heavily linked and the players ended up making a domestic move instead. But from what we're hearing, it seems like uh, Calafiori is actually quite open to moving abroad. And he's he's done it before, so it's not new to him in the way that it would be new to a lot of other Italian players. Now, there's a few things I want to tell you that I've learned from speaking to some of my Italian colleagues whilst being out here in Germany for Euro 2024. Um, if we go back to the 1819 season, Riccardo Calafiori suffered a really bad knee ligament injury, uh, which kept him out for a long, long time, for the best part of a year. Um, and I know that when people are kind of digging into him and looking into his background, that is something that's going to come up, right? So why not address it? It's it was a bad injury sustained at a young age, and that type of injury always for me can give can create a little bit of a red flag. However, what I would say is this: there doesn't seem to have been any real recurrence of that problem, which suggests that he's over it. Those types of injuries are so common these days, and the rehabilitation uh, process is so thorough and you know effective these days that. <laughs> You know, yes, you should think about it and you should consider it, of course, when you're making a significant and major investment. But is it as career defining as it maybe used to be? I don't know. If we were talking, you know, Arsenal going in nine months after he suffered this injury, then I'd be a lot more wary. But the fact this was back in the 1819 season and we're talking about him being in the form of his life at the end of the 23-24 season... I kind of tend to worry about it less in this case, in this instance. Now, there was another um, sort of little anecdote that I wanted to tell you guys about Ricardo Calafiori. And this was something that I would have never known. Um, but I do know because, as I say, I, I spoke to uh, my colleague here um, who's out with me in Italy from the 90-minute uh, Italian edition. And he pointed me in the direction of one particular Jose Mourinho press conference. Now, it's been well documented that Jose Mourinho didn't really fancy Ricardo Calafiori at Roma, and it was he who sanctioned the sale to FC Basel. There was a, a heavy defeat um, that Roma uh, suffered, and at that time, Mourinho saw Ricardo Calafiori as one of the players that was, I guess, in his eyes at least, responsible for that. Now, what my friend did was point me in the direction of a video which I've watched. I've Google translated. He translated it for me as well. But what I've done is Google translated the quote so that I'm not putting words into Jose Mourinho's mouth. But basically, this is what he said. OK, so um, he said there are benches and this was after a Roma defeat. OK, he said there are benches and there are benches in Serie A. Today we played with the line of four where Karsdorp was a doubt until the end. And the defenders I had on the bench were Reynolds, Kumbula, and Calafiori. And then he paused. What he was basically saying, if you listen to his tone, and if you understand uh, the context of these comments, was there are some really strong benches in Serie A, and then I've got a really weak one. And I turn to me, uh, sorry, I turn to my bench when I've got a problem, when I've got a defender who's running on empty, who is um, struggling with the game. And I see Reynolds, Kombula, but significantly here, Calafiori. Basically, they're not good enough. That was what Jose Mourinho was saying. He was being very um, direct and making the point that in his eyes, none of those players were up to the standard. None of those players were good enough for him to consider bringing them on. And therefore, his squad wasn't good enough and that, overall needed work but he singled out these three players because they were on the bench that day and we know what he thought of Ricardo Calafiori because he moved him on the fact that Calafiori has gone away 
two FC Basel come back and is now playing brilliantly um, for Bologna and for Italy says a lot about his character. The fact that he came through that knee injury too and is now playing the best football of his career, again, says a lot about his character, his mental strength. So I'm not surprised when I think about all of that and I put all of that context into the conversation that he is one of the few Italian stars in recent years that's actually willing to go, do you know what? That's the best league in the world. I'm going to go there and I'm going to show everybody what I can do. I'm not surprised by that because this guy has come through difficulty before. He's come through adversity before and he's clearly very strong minded. In terms of what I can tell you about the player, he looks like he's got a great deal of flair. This is what the eye test tells me. There's a lot of flair. Okay, there's a lot of confidence. There's a lot of belief. There is a very, very high technical level um, that he, he can play to. Do I think that Ricardo Calafiori is the finished article? No, I don't. I still think there's a lot of work to be done. But when you're talking about someone who's 22 years old, you don't mind there still being a bit of work to be done. Did I think Ben White, for instance, was the finished article when Arsenal signed him? No, but he looks great. Did I think that William Saliba was the finished article when Arsenal signed him? No, but he looks great. Do I think that Gabriel was the finished article when Arsenal signed him? No, but again, he looks great. And so... If the player is showing enough promising signs, and then I factor in the fact that I really do believe in Mikel Arteta and his coaching staff's ability to progress these players and develop them. There's been so many good examples, particularly when we're talking about defensive players. Then I'm absolutely fine with this. I really, really am. Um, so the eye test tells me, yes, um, all of the things that I've mentioned, the flair, the quality, all the rest of it, very bold, very brave in his positioning. But he also looks like a really competent defender as well, which is kind of important when you're talking about a centre-back slash left-back. Um, I think for me, you know, during these Euros, and, and I covered the group stages from England, but have been out here for the knockout stages so far. One of the things that I was hearing back in England after a couple of really good Calafiori performances was, oh my God, this is the next Paolo Maldini. This is the next Alessandro Nesta. And that was partly because of what I mentioned right at the top, the way he looks. I think people were looking at it and going, oh my God, this is like a flashback to like the late 90s. And we're seeing great Italian centre-halves with all the swagger in the world re-emerging again. And Calafiori is like a, a, a sort of throwback to that. People need to calm down a little bit in terms of where he's at today. Talk of him being... A Maldini or a Nesta is certainly premature. But then when you take a step back and you watch him, you can kind of see why people are saying that. It's not just the aesthetics. It's the way that he plays. It's the confidence with which he plays. Last season, uh, Calafiori played 30 games in the Serie A. He played a total of 2,349 minutes. And to kind of put into context... Um, how offensively minded he is for a centre-back. This is a guy that got two goals and five assists. Seven direct goal contributions. There are forwards in the Premier League that didn't even get that last season. So that's really, really strong. Um, I, you know, I think he's he's shown that he can do both sides of the game. And I think in Mikel Arteta's system, more than any other, that's really, really important. If I bring up some of his statistics on FB Ref and we talk about those, um, there's a lot of positives when we're looking at the attacking metrics and this will be him being compared over the last 365 days to his peers across the other top five leagues in Europe. You know, assists. He's in the 99th percentile because to, to produce the number of assists that he did from centre-back last season, you know, we're talking five assists for a centre-back is, is truly remarkable. So you got to tip your hat to him for that. Um, surprisingly, there are more centre-backs in the top five leagues or are quite a few more centre-backs that have had more shots than him. I'm talking about his offensive capability. It's mad. He's only in the 71st percentile for that, which is uh, a little bit strange. Shot-creating actions, he's in the 97th percentile. On average... He produces 1.76 shot-creating actions per match, per 90 minutes. For a centre-half, that is remarkable. 
Passes attempted, he's in the 80th percentile. Pass completion rate is at 89.6%. Now, normally when I'm looking at a centre-back, that would be a bit of a red flag for me because I think centre-back is one of the positions in which you can ill afford to give the ball away. You can't take the risks that a winger takes or that an attacking midfielder takes or a forward takes um, to try and make things happen because if you lose the ball at the back, there's often consequences to pay. But the fact that it is 89.6%, which is a bit low, and it does put him in the 79th percentile, I'm kind of going to look at it through a more positive lens than the negative one that I would normally look at this through when I'm talking about centre-back, because I know what Calafiore is like. If I looked at another centre-back with a pass completion rate like this, I would worry about it. But because I know he always wants to play on the front foot, because I, always, I know he always wants to move the ball forward, because I know he always wants to progress things and as early as possible, I'm kind of okay with that in a weird way. Um, Take-ons, he's in the 92nd percentile. So clearly quite confident and happy, as I've said, to, to bring the ball out of the defence. Another thing that maybe you would look at and think, well, that's not very good if you're looking at it purely through the lens of a centre-back, is tackles. Average is 1.8 per 90. He's only in the 74th percentile. But it's not the Italian way to step out and make loads and loads of tackles. That's not how they defend. That's not how they're taught to defend. It's not how they're brought up to defend. Paolo Maldini once said, I think it was Paolo Maldini. It's a bloody great quote. So if I'm credit crediting it to Paolo Maldini and it isn't his, I'm sure he'll take it. You don't actually need to make a tackle to defend well. And if you make a tackle, it's because you defended badly in the first place. It's all about positions. It's all about showing people down the corridors that you want to show them down. It's all about shepherding people into the areas from which they can do little or no damage at all. And so I'm not concerned about the fact that he's only in the 74th percentile for tackles. When it comes to interceptions, he's right up there, 96th percentile on that which suggests that he reads the game really really well and these are things that i'm hugely encouraged by so to kind of summarize on ricardo calafiori and what i think he would be for arsenal and why i think signing him would be a, a wonderful idea and brilliant if we could pull it off i think in this player we've got a super confident bold combative but also flary defender that I think is quite rare in the modern game. I think the fact that he's left-footed and has played a lot of his career at left fullback and left wingback and in central areas means that he can help us on that left-hand side in a variety of different ways. I see this very simply as an upgrade on Jakob Kivior. Now, maybe people will say that's unfair. Don't pick on Jakob Kivior. He hasn't done that much wrong. He hasn't played enough to really get his feet under the table and really show us what he can do. He's played a lot of the time when he has played out of his position and maybe that's a little bit unfair on him. Totally get that. Totally agree with that. But you've got to be ruthless at the top level. And this is an opportunity for Arsenal to upgrade on a player that I still think there are question marks about. Ricardo Calafiori, as I say, is not the finished article but he's got a much higher ceiling than Jakob Kivio has. And it's clear to me that Mikel Arteta isn't totally convinced that Alexander Zinchenko is the way to go at left back anymore. So this could address a problem on the left-hand side. Last season, people kept saying, the only reason we got a problem on the left is because Timber's been uh, unavailable. Do you think that Timber was signed with the intention of him playing left back every single week? Because I don't really see that. It's not a position he'd ever played before. You know, very much a right-sided defender, someone who could play at centre-back but could go onto the right as well. That's what Julian Timber is. We need depth. We need options. We need numbers. And this is a guy who seems to have all of the technical attributes that we'd like, has the... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Has the mentality to take on a new challenge and to succeed because we've seen him suffer... A horrible injury a number of years ago at a really tender age and come through it and come through it and end up being much stronger we've seen him be shipped off um, to FC Basel after almost being 
well, basically being told he's not good enough by Jose Mourinho, which can be quite difficult for a young man to take, I think, particularly when you're almost banished from your own club, Roma, the club that he grew up loving and, and, and coming through. I think he's shown us that he can bounce back from those difficulties. I think he's a player that the fans would get behind. I think this is Arsenal being proactive rather than reactive in the transfer market because it's not like we've got a huge need for a left centre-back slash left-back when you think about the number of options that we have. But it tells me that Arsenal have seen an opportunity and they're going to bloody take it. And they're going to take it because they know that they can't afford to stand still and that the evolution of this team has to be ongoing. When I look at the statistics... I think there are some red flags there, as I've mentioned in this episode already. But I think when you know what Calafiore is all about and you understand his character and you understand what's special about his game, you you kind of then start to look at some of these metrics through a slightly different lens. Now, that's not to say that he's complete and there's no issues with him and that if he joins Arsenal, he's not going to make a mistake or two. I expect all of that. I think players that are bold and brave in their approach will at times make mistakes. And the question is, does that boldness and bravery outweigh and the benefits of that outweigh what comes as a risk because of their style of play? And I think in Calafiore's case, I'd be more than willing to take that risk. I think the price that Bologna are asking is quite reasonable. Has it been boosted a little bit? Is there a bit of a Euro 2024 tax on there? Yeah, probably Um, it's understandable, right? That's how it works. But I think in conclusion, this would be a really, really good move. This is one that I'd be excited about. This is a player who has caught my attention and has me hooked in terms of wanting to see where this goes, how he develops, how he progresses. And yeah, I think Arsenal, if they can get this deal done, will have one hell of a player on their hands in Ricardo Calafiori flair style um everything that you feel has maybe faded away from football in recent years but some of us of a certain age we do uh, latch onto it when we see it rarely like we do now in the likes of this player and uh yeah I- i'd love us to get this deal done and i can't wait to see how he gets on apologies the format is not quite the same as some of the previous scouting report shows in terms of the graphics don't look as good and all the rest of it but as I've mentioned a million and one times already, I am out in Germany. I don't have my studio set up. I don't have anything other than a laptop and this headset um, to bring you these podcasts with. And um, I'm uh, I'm doing my best. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you've joined us on the audio platforms, remember, if you're listening on audio, leave us a review. If you're watching on YouTube, do subscribe and leave a like on the video. It really, really does help. Those are my thoughts on Ricardo Calafiori. That's why I think he'd be a great signing. That's what I know about him at the moment. And fingers crossed, between now and the end of the window, he becomes an Arsenal player. I'll see you all on the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves. All the best. Goodbye.